Hey, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Hey, look who we have here, the mask bandit. This Roman. is this is Roman, Roman Gottfried. From here on in, Roman is now a permanent fixture on the Dog Connection show. Welcome. He's uh yeah, he's he's the new host and he, he has the mask on today because he's actually in Oregon, but he's out in public. He's in a public area. So he has to be very cautious and he's practicing social not social distancing. We decided that it's not social. Our friend Sebastian <clears throat> will tell you. It's physical distancing with social connectedness. So we really like that. Let's let's use that. And that goes right in line with the Dog Connection TV. That's that's what we're talking about is being socially connected, not only at the, the heart level, but the mind level and the body level. So today we're going to be talking about uh, how you can train your, how you can be the best dog trainer. Uh, Roman offers a wonderful, wonderful online course. And you're probably wondering, how can you do an online course? How can you really connect with your dog? Well, you'll find out from him today on that. But first, we want to talk about the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful responses that are occurring from people all across the world that are literally fostering dogs while they're home alone. What else have they they've got to do? So some of the shelters are really barren. Gaetan is going to take over on this. I'm going to share the screen, Gaetan, so you can go ahead. Well, in the past two weeks, there was a number of articles published in different publication, magazine, and newspaper. And back in uh, mid-March, there was a call for people to foster animals. And the answer was pretty interesting and pretty amazing. Uh, quickly, people start to react and answer the call and look, uh, contact with their shelter in New York, Phoenix, St. Louis, Memphis, Tennessee, and North Forks, uh, Austin, Texas, all, all over the country. It was like a, a movement where people were going to the local shelter and foster pet. Another article shortly after that is, uh, hold on a second. Yes, I want to show you. This is CBS in New York, in Detroit, sorry. And again, they were talking about the, uh, the demand and the reaction of the people and how the people react and answer the call for fostering pets. And uh, little by little, they, the answer, I will not say little by little. This is in a period of two weeks. It's went from a call for fostering to the reaction of the people. Like in within four days, people react around the country, and uh, people are stepping up. This is an article from U.S. News and World Report, and it say that on March 24th, about 10 days, nine days after the first call, uh, isolate. Uh, the article said. Isolated by pandemic, people are stepping up to foster pet. And we have this article from the New York Times. And this is a very interesting, uh, I will read just one paragraph of the article. It said, uh, when the Animal Care Center of New York put a call out on Friday for application of its fostering program, it was looking to fill 200 available slots. A spokeswoman for the shelter said, 2,000 people applied. Yay. Yeah. So, Isn't that, that's the way to go. Yeah. Come on, Americans. You, you can do it. Yes. We can empty those shelters. That's, that's like a very positive note. Yeah. Very good note. Uh, shelter pandemic. I love it. Yes. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> this, uh, I, I went a little bit further and I went to the uh, Animal Humane Society of America. And they, they present, uh, the topic is, do you have a COVID-19 plan for your pet? And that's the question. And they propose a three-step plan. The first one is know the fact. There's no evidence that people can get COVID-19 from the pet. And there's a caveat there. And the caveat is the, the dog or the pet will not get the virus internally. But... The fact 
is if somebody pet your dog and the person is infected by the virus, the, the, the fur of the pet will catch the virus and the virus will uh, survive on the fur of the pet for several hours, maybe several days, okay? Bring the pet home, no glove, no mask, interact with the pet, get infected. So the suggestion, and you can comment on that, Katy and uh, Roman, uh, the suggestion is that not let anybody pet your dog when you're taking a walk with your dog outside. Exactly. Roman, you, Katy, you have comments? It happened to me yesterday. I I had to get some extra supplies because I live in an RV full time. So our supplies is kind of limited how much we can fit in an RV. Mm -hmm. So I had to get some groceries um, and of course, you know, dressed and everything. And there was a dog in the middle of the street and the person walking. And usually I'm going up to the dog and ask if I can meet the dog, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, no, no, you just ignore it. Keep walking. You don't need to touch the dog. There is no need to touch the dog. Keep walking. And I passed the dog without touching. So you can survive without touching anyone's stranger's dog. Yeah. And I think we should be very, very clear that you have to protect your dog. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. if you get sick because somebody else touched the dog, then you would not be able to care for your dog. And yeah. your dog end up in a difficult situation. So yeah. if you don't care about the others, care about your dog and care about yourself. Mm -hmm. Just protect yourself. A mask is not a big deal. You can design a paw, write your name on it. Wear your gloves. I have a whole package of hand gloves. Mm -hmm. I go into the grocery, I throw them away, I have a small box, I just throw them in there. So my car is clean. As soon as I leave my car, I wear my gloves. As soon as I get in my car, the gloves are out. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure it's clean. Plus, yeah. I have a spray bottle with me. Voila. So I can have this, you know, inexpensive spray bottles. You can take it with stuff that you have in your home. Liquid of alcohol, you can some essential oil, spray your hand done perfect you can touch your keys your pen mm -hmm. and you're good to go yeah mm -hmm. the humane society uh, was adding to that point um as a point two and three is identify someone who can help if you are hospitalized or become too ill to care for your pet just common sense the third point is prepare a pet kit supply in case you're not uh, able to take care of your dog for a period of time and I think this is just a common sense there. Um, this is the, uh, if you want the reference, it's animalhumanesociety.org. And you can go there. The other uh, point this morning, I contacted our friend at the Naperville Area Humane Society. And I asked them, what is the status? What's going on locally uh, in terms of fostering? And I spoke with uh, Jennifer, uh, which is uh, in charge there. And Jennifer told me that most of the pet, most of the dog uh, found their foster homes. And uh, some pet cannot be, uh, did not receive as much interest or uh, attention because they have either a behavior problem, like a, a dog, for instance, cannot be in a house with a cat and the dog cannot be with another dog in the same house. And for that reason, the people are turned off by these characteristics. And Jennifer was mentioning it's, it's purely a matter of like not knowing or ignorance. And uh, I think this is where training of the owner will play a very positive role in there. Yeah. And I think Roman has something in that regard for us. Yeah, we will talk about that at the end. Um because I feel like everybody should know the basics. It's not just mm -hmm. about saving dogs from a shelter because we can put ourselves in danger. We can put the shelter dogs in danger. We can put our own dogs in danger. We not follow basic foster, foster rules, mm -hmm. but we will talk about that. Let's say a good morning to some of our fans that are here now. Good morning, Dale. Good morning. Good morning, Dale. Good morning, Ron. And hey, Roman, look at you're here. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, And here's our good friend, Paul. He says, good morning, guys. Working out a funeral home for the last five days. Return back to the human funeral directing. You do not want to get this virus. Most of the funerals are closed casket and medically sealed. Oh, boy, I bet. Yeah. Oh, gosh. And and let's see. He says... um, 36 hours of the dog wet areas near the nose is more dangerous. Oh, really? Okay. So the wet area near the nose is what's more dangerous. Okay. That's good to know. Thanks so much. Okay. So now how, Roman, this is your cue now. How can people become their dog's best trainer? Let me know when you want to start with the slides. Well, we're, let's go. Let's go for it. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so, a few things. It's really basics, um, but we need to understand the dogs um, are emotional, intelligent beings. Um, they are not just boxes of fur and they poop and they bark. They are really emotionally intelligent, just like a five year old. Mm-hmm. So, we have to take that in consideration. When we take the dog in the first day or the first week, We want to make sure that the first thing we have to establish is a secure attachment relationship. That alone takes care of most of the behaviors that a dog shows the first week because of his insecurities being in a new home where the dog doesn't feel safe. There is no safe place. There is no safe person. There is no consistency to anything. Everything has changed. So the dog just lost his home, lost a considering kind of structured place like a shelter or a foster home and goes into a new home, it's completely new environment. So environmental factors are 58% of a dog's behavior. The rest is genetics. So we control those 58%. So rule number one, you have to establish a secure attachment relationship and start from there because that will help the dog trust you going through the process. You will start listening to your commands. You start understanding, you know, his initial interaction with each other. You start speaking the same language and that will calm the dog down because you will not be a stranger anymore. You'll be a reliable person your dog can refer to. And so the next thing we want to um, do is start creating um, the next slide would be. Can can I ask something first on on the first one? Now, isn't it important, too, that when you bring the dog in from, from, let's say, the shelter or a different environment or a foster, that your energy levels have to be at such a level where it's not going to project any fear to the animal? Because if you're fearful, then them walking into a new place, they become fearful, too. Am I right on that? That, That's that's a good point. Uh, We have to take in consideration that we have family members who are excited. We have dogs who are excited. So excitement is the one side. It goes into higher level, then it switches to anxiety. So excitement and anxiety are kind of the opposites. Too much excitement can lead to anxiety. Anxiety causes frustration. Frustration causes aggression. So I want to make sure that the way we introduce the dog is calmness, not yelling, not screaming, not organizing social parties, right? The yeah. Dog, let's keep it quiet. The dog needs at least couple of days to settle down and I know there is a a concept of the idea of doing um, the compression but the compression is just a word there's a whole meaning behind this Mm -hmm. so I call it re-imprint period where the dog has to imprint his new environment imprinting his new people and basically goes the same structure that he went as as a puppy start trusting his closest caretakers understand where the safety comes from where the food comes from where the water is where my safe place is who is family, who are strangers. And so that has to be established. Otherwise, the dog will not settle in. And the last thing we want is to fail the foster, doing foster care in these first two weeks. And 10% of fosters under normal conditions are failing and they are returned or adoption are returned the first two weeks. Really? Why is that now? Because the- people have certain expectations. The dog doesn't have uh, you know, you cannot cover those expectations. The dog has expectations. People don't cover those expectations. And all of a sudden, we have a conflict of expectations because we expected the perfect dog and he expected the perfect person. And that's my goal that I want. And I also teach foster classes for national rescues and shelters to teach fosters to deeply understand that they are a key factor to the rescue community. So we want to empty shelters like we perfectly did now why? Because they went to foster care. 
So fostering care is a huge key factor that we actually suppress for some point. I understand why, because we want the shelter going directly to adoption. Now we see the value of a foster. We wanted empty shelters. Here we are. The fosters helped us out. But the fosters are not a parking lot. They are essential for the dog's healing process because the reason why the dog end up in a shelter or end up free roaming around is because somewhere something failed. And something right. that failed did a damage to the dog, more or less. And I'm not saying that shelter dogs are damaged, but there is an emotional factor to that, the cost for the dog to leave his home that he considered good. Now he's free, end up in a shelter. Mm -hmm. It's not a good place to be in a shelter. It's, it's worse than a, than a prison because the dog doesn't understand why he's in there. He didn't do anything wrong being there. He thought he would be perfect. Well, people saw it differently and he ended up there. Mm -hmm. So when he ended up in their home as a foster care, we want to make sure that it's not a parking lot. It's not a convenience. It's a healing process. So we open our arms for somebody who is an emotional need and we need to see it as a dog who is in emotional recovery. Okay. Well, you know, now this is a really good point here because now when I lived in Arkansas, uh, let's say maybe about 10 years ago, we created, well, it was a, shell, uh, uh, a kill shelter in Arkansas. And we formed a foster care group that would go to the shelter and get the dogs the day they were scheduled to be euthanized, which is typical, could be 50, 60 dogs. But it was imperative that anybody that came into our foster program had to be trained. So what you're saying is that not all foster, not all shelters train the foster homes on what to do. And that's a real, real problem. Because if, if that dog is coming into your home just because I want to save him from, from being euthanized, he may be mistreated more at your house because you don't know how to deal with him coming out of that environment. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's so crass. Well, it is a little bit like shelters always want to educate. Like there is a, a, usually shelters organized and they have a shelter education program, more or less. Now, there is a problem here because people come in excited but don't listen. They believe they know everything. So they don't trust the professional who had the evaluation of the dog and give them instructions. They go home and like, oh my God, I have a foster dog. I do whatever I think is right. And that is exactly wrong. So if we take a dog from foster care into foster care, we have to follow the behaviorists and the instructions that the foster coordinator sets in place. Usually good rescues and good shelters have a whole binder of information that you have to take and read through it. Please read through it. There are all information there that you need. How to introduce it to the cats, how to introduce the dogs, how to introduce with kids, with no people. And that is an important factor. Don't don't annoy, don't ignore it. Because the last thing you want is to pick up the phone and says, I want him out now because he growled at my baby. Right. Yeah. So we have we have a problem with the basic communication skills. Growling is not aggression. Just because the dog is concerned about something doesn't call him aggressive. If you would take my coffee away this morning, you're going to see what aggression looks like. <laughs> <laughs> so in that context, I feel the shelters and the, and, and the foster coordinators from rescues and shelters are doing a great job. And I really appreciate it because guess who is in the shelter right now working with those dogs? All these volunteers who put their families aside and help those dogs getting food, exercise, and clean shelters and kennels. Yeah. And we come in to support them and the foster. So I'm calling basically all trainers right. who do not have any work to do right now because most of them cannot go to any person. Call your local rescue, call your local shelter and offer free service to help those people in need. A phone call, an answer, it just takes you 10 minutes to answer a question. It takes only five questions to understand what's going on in that household and give those people the guidance you get the job at the end anyway right. if something goes wrong. They will call you. So it's not about charging money. It's it's right now we're doing a service here, right? Right. Because otherwise, if we don't do that, what's gonna happen is most of those dogs are gonna end up back in the shelter. That's the right. Shelter will be full already from other people who end up in the hospital. And mm -hmm. what are gonna do next? We start killing them. That's not That's the right, right thing to do. So right now we op we open that kind of worms. We have to clean up. Right. Hey, hey, uh, Roman, real quick. Paul, Paul is stating here, you know, he's a, um, um, he, he's a, got a bio 
a cremation service in Australia, and he's he's saying, uh, try to stop touching your mask with your hands. He said he knows it's really hard, but you can get the germs in that way too. So he's he's just looking out for you. Okay, so let's go on with uh, uh, respect and communication. So respect and communication is the first thing that a dog likes to have. He needs to be respected for his needs. He needs to be respected of his worries. So, and then as soon as we establish communication, we can convey a two-way communication. I hear you. I understand your worries. So therefore, I respond to your requests. At the same time, as we respond to the dog's behavior, we confirm the dog's behavior. So if the dog worries and I'm keeping in distance, I confirm that I listen to you. I'm not, don't, you don't need to worry about it. If you do something for me, I will do something for you. And if I do something for you, then you can do something for me. And all of a sudden we have a conversation of a non-verbal language. So we have an emotional interaction, a body interaction that we communicate with the dog and that will calm the dog down. Okay. So we don't need to always speak with our language and words because words don't mean actually nothing other than noise for the dog, but our emotional language and of and a telepathic communication, I care for you. I worry about you. These are messages any prey animal can get so he can separate a predator from a prey, right? Well, you know, also now with the with the dogs telepathically, they do know. They definitely can catch on what you're doing. If you're going to the bathroom, they know you're going and they're right in there with you. <laughs> oh, just a joke. Are we on the next slide now? Yeah. So okay. the next thing that I would like to pay attention to is the conduct and behavior. So the first thing that they usually people when, when we work online is you have to create a family code of conduct. The dog should know what the rules are and you have to be consistent to the rules. Imagine you're going to visit to a, to, a, to a person that you know and you love and care. You have a certain standard that you behave. You just don't open the drawers. You just don't open any door without knocking. You just don't open the refrigerator because we have a social conduct that we have to follow. So our behavior is connected to those rules. You behave differently in Japan than you behave in America, than you behave in Greece, or when you behave in Norway, because the social structure is different. So if you don't know it, you're going to be embarrassed. So the dogs have the same thing. He wants to be socially correct. He wants to be um, offering correct behaviors, because that's what secures him in his place. So if you don't give him that information, all we do is we create confusion. And this is how we also transmute the morals and ethics. Mm -hmm. What I like, what I don't like, what I appreciate, what I don't, what I feel offended by, and how can you fix it? And so we give the dog that option to navigate through our social crazy human rules because dog rules are very simple. You don't like it, ignore it. You mm -hmm. like it, go get it. Make sense? Well, you know what, speaking of conduct and behavior now, so let's look at this scenario. So now you've got a family of, um, let's say, four, two boy, a, a boy and a girl, a husband and wife, and they're at home because of the coronavirus. Now, they're saying that even at home, you should have the six-foot rule and the distancing. That's very difficult if you've got a dog because the dog goes from one person to the other, to the other, to the other. So are they supposed to carry wipes with them? And little kids aren't going to do that. Uh, so uh, there's going to be a lot of confusion about how to do it. Now, if I had two kids and they were young, I'd put them each in their room. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel we have some certain, and, and I'm not a medic veterinarian, and, I, and it's kind of my common sense. That's, that's, I explain my common sense. I have, I have my, one of my family members is immune compromised. Theoretically, I could kill her right. if I'm not careful. Why? Because if she has you know, a problem, I will not be able to bring her to the hospital because she's not an emergency until I figure out she's one. And by then we have a problem. Mm -hmm. So I have to be very conscious about it. Yes, we cannot have social distance in the house. So when I'm coming in, I have to consider myself compromised. I have to consider myself infested. So I have to take care of myself. So I have to take my clothes off. That's why I have my raincoat on. I take it off and put it in my bag and that goes straight to the laundry. So for right. me, going outside for shopping is an adventure. And if you have kids in your house, 
and they have to communicate with you know other people then you have to make take measures and if you have a person in the house who is sick and compromised and you want to keep him socially isolated and you have in bedroom and you want the dog to be there well guess what's going to happen you have to take care of the dog too so you right. have to have a separate leash you have to wipe down the dog and there are there are clean supplies that you can use without the dog being damaged um this one is an organic hand sanitizer i don't want to really give any names out there um i have to really check into that in particular because we are totally isolated i don't have that problem but it's an organic um sanitizer and actually it's my wife refilled it because she's a herbalist too so she fixed that for me there are all these herbals in there they are good for dogs except of the alcohol which will evaporate pretty quick once, once you wipe it down so if usually i take a wipe down and wipe my dog down with that alcohol and that's pretty good the dog doesn't lick himself at that point or you wear him a jacket okay but i would say you know you have to be very careful anyway i i, I cannot answer that question in particular with dogs mm -hmm. um i think yeah. the medical person would be more appropriate to do that yeah but. good morning son that's my son okay so now are we done with this slide you want to go to the next one yeah let's go to the next one okay now health and wellness well, well here we are right so I think many people um, take in consideration that everything is provided for. And, you know, the shelter and the foster coordinator will provide you food and will provide you everything that a dog needs. It comes with a package of health. Usually they are up to date with vaccinations and medication. Some dogs have medical issues like uh, diabetes or any other medical that need to be complied. We need to be very careful to keep those rules. Put a, put a timer on. You cannot forget giving the dog the medication and you cannot sometimes skip a medication because that could be fatal for the dog. Now, most of those who are medical fosters know exactly what to do. So I'm speak, speaking to the choir here, but we have eventually that particular person who is the medical foster care get sick. One of his family members had to take care of it. So again, we're going square one. We need to know what to do. So in order to be a good foster parent or a dog parent, you have to make sure that you understand the health and wellness. It's not about the dog surviving in your house. It's about to get well. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yeah. So providing the dog with emotional, physical, healthy environment and creating a safe place will have the dog free out of stress. Make sure you have no toxins around. Medication have to be gone. Uh, cleaning supplies have to be gone. A dog in stress will start chewing. He would not stop. He will chew himself through a door. So if there is a potential that a dog can access an area that you can reach, the dog can reach too because he saw you doing it. He knows how to get there. I've seen dogs pushing a chair against the counter and step on the counter. We don't say any names. My chihuahua did it. Okay? <laughs> she, she jumped on the chair and jumped on the wall. And such a small thing was in a two-feet counter, really. Okay? Now... We have to be very careful, especially for dogs who have separation anxiety, okay? Even if we are present and the dog follows everywhere, you know, we take medication, oops, the medication dropped down. You have to pick it up. You cannot just leave it there for later because most of this medication have a consisting smell and some of them are attractive, even if that is just dog medication. And you know that dog medication sometimes have a flavor, so the dog will likely eat it. Well, the dog will find that medication. He can smell a couple of particles per billion, billion, not million. He find that package, he's going to chew on that, and then he's going to die. So keep things away from dogs. Put it in a glass jar. Close the jar, glass jar. Put it away in the shelf so there's no way for anybody to get there. No dogs, no kids. Okay. Uh, Paul has got, he's got a, the commercial hand sanitizers may contain other ingredients, for example, preservatives to prolong shelf life. Homemade sanitizers contain only alcohol, so it is better to keep it in the fridge for pr prolonged use. Uh, here is the taste tested recipe amended from one shared by U.S. author Ma Marion, Marion McKenna. Mix in a clean container, rubbing alcohol, uh, aloe vera gel, a few drops of essential oil for scent, and then uh, decant into a clean covered container or dispenser. Thanks so much, Paul. Paul always gives us the information. It seems as though what he does is he... Yeah. <laughs> and Roman has done exactly that, I, I suspect. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Right at the source. Okay. Great. So let's go to the next one. 
and then love and, and healing. Well, I, I see people all the time questioning, well, you know, I, I love that foster. Can I love him as much as I love my, my other dogs? Of course. You know, dogs love unconditionally, so they don't make any difference who you are and what you are. If you're drunk, if you're not, if you're sick, if you're old, if you're young, if you have a beard and you wear a mask, the dog loves you just as, as likely. However, when, when we offer love, we have to consider it's how the dog perceives it. If I would love my dog unconditionally, who's going to feed him? Who's going to take him out for a walk? Who's going to create structure? Who's going to give him the rules that he has to set as a, as a family member, as a parent? So I love my kids, but it has consequence if you don't follow instructions. And consequence doesn't mean you have to get punished. Don't take me wrong here. So human love accompanied with structure and guidance and affection. And dogs need a variety of energies to function and heal. It's not just me loving. It's me being structured. It's not me just telling the dog what to do. I have to be also explanatory. It's not me just having expectations. I have to help the dog get to that point so he can have his own ideas and his own troubleshooting skills without me micromanaging all the time. So that, during that period of time that we step in as fosters and caretakers, we give that dog a guaranteed evolution to survive when he was being adopted after us. So a foster is not a forever home. The foster is a temporary place, but it's not a place to drown, it's a place to rise. So as a foster, what we have to do here is we have to offer that dog all the tools necessary to survive once he leaves the house. Just like, you know, most of you are parents, when your child grows up and finishes school and goes outside, what are you worried about? That you failed. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? You have to be proud that your child will make it out there because you gave him the tools that he needs. Let yeah. him go. Let him open his wings. But be there, stand by. Whatever the dog needs your help, up, you step in and, and support him. And that's why having proper parenting skills, you teach the dog how to express his needs, not just through barking and pawing and peeing in the corner. It's not how you get attention. Sitting and paying attention to me is how you get attention in return. Right. All these small details that actually created the whole... Um, class, a foster education class that I started teaching in Austin in 2015. Um, and that class, based on statistics, which Mattis Fund uh, supported that class, were amazing. People who didn't dare taking care of aggressive dogs suddenly felt confident taking in aggressive dogs and help them overcome those behaviors. So as a foster and as a dog parent, we have to step in as a parenting and take those skills on and not being just reliant on the dog trainer to take care of that. It's not the dog trainer's job to take care of your dog. It's a parenting skill that we have to learn. Right. And, and you know, the other thing, too, is it, a good point when you said that uh, the, um, the dogs have to be paying attention to you. It's just like with a human. If you're talking to a human and they're looking around and everything, you know they're not paying attention to you. So, or they're they're looking at something, or they're looking down here, or that's like if you go to an attorney, usually they're looking down, they're not paying attention to you. But most of the time, uh, you stop because you realize I don't have this person's attention. The same thing holds true for a dog. Don't try and train a dog that isn't paying attention to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. Hey, I think you have a friend here too. Hi from me and Yaakov and Emma. <laughs> Hi Donna. Uh, okay. And, um, okay. So that was the end. Now I, I wanted to, um, ask you about this new program that you have. I know that you have a foster program, but now with the coronavirus and there's a lot of people that are at home right now, you are doing such a wonderful, wonderful gesture. You are offering your services literally um, for what people can pay. Am I right or wrong? Right. I, I made a decision and um, I had, I had to think about it a little bit because I didn't want to come in out of, of luck or um, I didn't want to put people in danger. Um, I have experience over 10 years doing remote training. I'm, I'm very conscious what problems everybody has. I was a foster care um, trainer in the past and as a trainer, as a dog lover, and I did a boarding and kennel situation in the past too. So I had to deal with many dogs with different behaviors. And what I saw is people need help now at their house because that's where the problem arises. 
And sometimes behaviors are not showing up if you bring your dog in a training facility and it doesn't show up if the trainer is at home. It happens while you're at home, while nobody's there to get the dog's attention. Now, I said to myself and I discussed with my wife because we are supportive to each other. I said, you know what? I want to give those people the chance for this for a month to have training support wherever they need. And if they can pay for it, it's fine. I, I take donations, but I, I want everybody to have that chance to get help as needed immediately. And I can be on a phone call in less than 20 minutes. I send you the code. You, you schedule your appointment. We're up and running. The questionnaire is so rich that I would know before you actually call what the solution to your problem is likely. And then in a phone call of 20, 20 minutes or 30 minutes, depending on what choice you have, you have a couple of choices available in my program. You can get exactly the help you need based on how you feel that that um, situation struggles you. If you're very scared of your dog, then I would go to a more advanced program. If you just kind of have a question about it, then go to a simple program. From 20 minutes to 90 minutes, you have all those choices. And I guarantee you by the end of the phone call, you know what's going on. We're going to get to the root of the problem and you know what to do. It's not just, you know, me giving me a call and me chat on the phone. I have better things to do, right? But I feel going to that point, um, well, I want to make sure that you get help. Doesn't mean you have to give up your trainer. Your trainer will be there at some point, but not right now because he cannot leave the house. And most of the trainers don't have that education or knowledge background to sit up on an online session and ask the right question to get the right answer. So I offer that too. If you guys, professionals are out there who, who don't have a problem talking to a colleague who has 10 years experience doing online training, I have like 2,500 clients worldwide that I work with with severe cases of dog-to-dog -dog aggression, human-dog aggression, and, and dog-human aggression, where we had to turn the dog around in less than a month. So I, I just give you a heads up. You can do it if you have knowledge. A little bit of basic dog training. You, go to the next, you can go to the next level and help your clients right now where they're most in need. So they don't need to outreach to somebody else who you don't know how they behave. Because there are many trainers out there who will have abu ab abusive and aversive methods to solve that problem. From spray bottles, shocker cans, and, and yelling at towels, throwing at your dog, whatever you can imagine, doing more damage. And if you do that to the foster care, are you actually knowing why the dog actually was surrendered? Mm -hmm. What if that behavior will escalate and the dog will become reactive to you because you have established a relationship, the dog will not take no as an answer. Mm -hmm. He's gonna challenge you in the so best case scenario. So are, are you offering for people that have foster dogs right now uh, the support? Wh whoever. Okay, because that program is whoever. Uh, for those people that have gone to the shelter and brought a foster dog in and may, may have been their first time, they might be lost right now and not know what to do because it's the instinct is let's take the dog in because you don't want to leave them exposed and you might have other dogs at home and all of a sudden the, the dog doesn't get along with the other dogs and now you might be penalizing the foster dog because they're causing a, a ruckus or a problem in the household. So if they contacted you, they can find out, well, what can I do with this dog? Because certainly they don't want to bring him back to the shelter. And, um, and, the shelter. It, Sorry. It, and uh, they, they want to be able to be good foster parents. Fostering is a, it's a difficult task on two levels. You bringing a dog that's a stranger into your home and you know it's temporary. Once you get attached to that dog, it's almost impossible to be able to give them up. However, if the dog is not really one that is going to get along with the family, you can't wait to get rid of them. So there's a, a balance. And what a lot of people should do if they're going to foster is find out if that's a good match for your, your family. But some don't. They just say, well, bring, it, bring them in, bring them in, bring them in, bring them in. And there ends up being a problem. That's just my humble opinion. Uh, uh, don't take it to heart, but just my humble opinion, but mark it down. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, fascinating. Um, so many rescues that are proactive. Um, I, I work together with uh, PAC 911, which is down in, in Arizona. You know, you know that. And so they, they called out and reached out to trainers and asked them, are you available for support? So I call the rescue and a volunteer says, you know, put me on the list. If anybody needs help, just give, let me give me a call. 
-hmm. And some fosters that I worked in the past in Phoenix called me and some rescues. And I worked with Rescue National Great Pyrenees Rescue. Uh, they are basically national wide um, massive to mats rescue. And uh, I don't have, recall all the names. I'm sorry if I didn't mention your name. So right now I'm standby for everyone. Yes, okay. I do feed a lot of people in there. So it's not, it's not going to fill me up so quickly. Okay. Days are long. So I can fit in between because I don't travel. I can fit mm -hmm. basically right. all my kids. Right, right. And and that's something that you can decide. And Gaetan, you were going to say something. Well, it's fascinating. It's very generous of you. And it's it's a need. Uh, I have a very limited experience with dog. But my experience is uh, the human need to be trained in order to have a good relationship with the dog. And you provide something which is in a very difficult period of time. Uh, which facilitate the connection between the human and the pets. Yeah, and, and there's uh, th the one thing I like about what Roman does is I watched a testimonial video from one of his his clients, and actually we showed it on the first show that he was on, and I was really amazed because it's it's hard to fathom. Well, how is he going to train me to work with my dog when he's there and I'm here? And the thing is, is that just picture this, folks, you're in your home, you're on Skype or whatever, a Zoom or whatever with Roman, and Roman is watching and he's observing how you are with your dog. And because of his expertise, he's able to identify problem areas that you don't even realize that you have. Mm -hmm. And that's like the outsider looking in. We always can critique what somebody else is doing wrong, and we don't realize that we're doing it wrong ourselves. So it's the same kind of thing. He has that expertise to be able to do that. So with his his um, uh, recommendations and you follow through, you'll find that slowly your dog will start to respond to you because you may have been doing something that was irritating the dog. You may have had a nervous habit. You may have been calling him a name. You may have been throwing something. You may have been doing something inadvertently that just triggered that dog to react in a very negative way. So, um, you know, that, well, that's it. Transformation can happen very quickly. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, I know people like the first session have a huge improvement because suddenly the dog recognizing that he's being hurt and he's being understood. The last thing a dog wants is to get frustrated because what he tries to explain to you doesn't work and your response is usually wrong. And, you know, we as the trainers, we are not perfect either. There's no perfect trainer out there because each dog is individually, each home is individually, each person is individually. So we have all these individualities coming in together as, as factors. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I do something that I used to do is because I usually avoid situations and naturally I, I, I didn't pay attention to that because my angle doesn't allow me to see it. But a third person over there watching that on the camera, I can tell you, hey, you're bending too much over to your dog. And it's like, oh man, right. Sorry. Right. It's, it's not it's not telling you that you're wrong. The goal is the dog to be helped. Yeah. The dog is the one who has a problem. Right. OK, well, this was a wonderful show. And just real quick, I want to personally say something to everyone. Listen, folks, we know that you are going through a very difficult time right now. You're, you're, you feel like you're stuck at home and there's two types of people. This is, again, my opinion. There's two types of people. There's those that are feeling very negative and very upset over the fact that they're at home. Uh, they're bored. They don't know what to do. They're worried about their bills. They're worried about uh, their jobs. And totally understandably so. And then there's are those who seem to be the leaders are taking a lead and they're saying, well, let's do this and let's do that. And they're coming up with phenomenal uh, uh, realistic ways of doing things and creative ways of doing things. So it, it, uh, it seems to be uh, there's two different types. So if we can all work together, because all of us that are dog lovers, we know that we, we know how to be compassionate and have empathy. If we can work together to be the leaders, to help those people during this time, let's all do it, okay? All right, that's, that's my two cents. That's very good, thank you. And I'm a life lover, so all life matter. That's yes, my point. yes, and namaste, everyone. Thank, thank you, you for watching. Thank you, Roman. And uh, please...